Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercio with the Global Perspectives Office. Our guest today is Winona LaDuc with the Honor the Earth Fund and the White Earth uh, Land Recovery Project. Welcome to our show today. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about both projects and what they entail. Well, I live and work on the White Earth Reservation, which is in northwestern Minnesota, and I've, uh, it's the community that I'm originally from. I've done that for most of my adult life. I work on sustainability issues there. Um, the questions of a poor rural community and how you recover control over your economy or future, you know, and so we work on land, culture, and environment. We, um, most of our land was taken illegally from us in the uh, uh, last part of the, in, in the last century and then just the end of the century before that in the 1890s. Um, this guy named Frederick Weyerhaeuser, I don't know the Weyerhaeuser Empire. <laughs> he got the trees and we got the stumps and in the end uh, we ended up with uh, having lost most of our land to him and some of his others and so we've been struggling for about a hundred years to get back our land. Most of the land inside the reservation, about 90 percent of it is held by non-Indian interests. The largest held by government landholders. So I've been working for my, my adult life on this process of recovering land, buying it back and seeing the transfer of it, hoping to see the transfer of it uh, back to our community, uh, particularly government, government held land. And so that's what I work on. And then uh, related to that, I work on um, culture, language. I'm, we have a big campaign right now on wild rice, trying to keep it from getting genetically engineered. Uh, which is a pretty big issue. The issues of the, of the white rice industry in terms of genetic engineering are certainly uh, pretty compelling. Over the past couple of years, they had a pretty big crash in their market because they had some genetically engineered rice, and then uh, we're working on renewable energy. So that's what I do in my own community, and then I have the privilege of working nationally, and I work with uh, a number of uh, native communities nationally and some internationally on, on similar issues. I'm a, I'm a rural development economist by training. So that's what I do. To go back to where you live again, um, you said that much of, you're, you're in the same vicinity, but on a much smaller parcel at this point. And you said the rest is controlled by a combination of government and commercial interests. Yeah, I wouldn't say we're on a much larger, par smaller parcel. It's kind of like, you know, I don't actually know the equivalent, like say Bermuda or some country, a third world country, or a country in which the country exists, but the land holdings are largely absentee. Okay. Right? So. It's not that, and so we retain harvesting rights throughout the reservation and we still, you know, most of our people live in housing projects. I live out in a rural area and we have some native farming projects, but we still harvest in the larger area. Um, yes, and then, but a lot of our struggle is, is that if you don't control the land tenure and you don't control the economy of the land, you know, then they can clear cut. Because others instance. too harvest from the area. Right, right. I mean, in this case, it's mostly clear cutting. It's not. The kind of harvesting we do is, you know, uh, our wild rice harvest just came in, a very good rice harvest, and, uh, but the, you know, the issues of, uh, we're doing pretty good on our rice protection, but the issues of our forest uh, remain you know, significant issues for our community. What would you say of the resources available on the entire reservation? What would be the percentage that you would use? I don't know if I can answer that question. I mean, we have 25,000 tribal members. We have enough wild rice to feed our community and enough deer and enough agricultural products and forest products to support you know those people and we have enough wind energy to create a pretty strong export economy and um, you know so that's what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the question of how you build an economy that's based on uh, nurturing and and recognizing the wealth that is there whether it is human or whether it is water we have 47 lakes um, you know 500 bodies of water we have a pretty diverse ecosystem that is a pretty healthy one and you know but the issues I deal with are issues that are you know they aren't I mean I do work mostly on Indian reservations but these are rural issues um, the issues of how you keep your youth in your community the issues of how you sustain a rural economy that is uh, vital and that is not uh, damaging you know or that is not based on a staples economy of mining it you know constantly or you know because that's not a sustainable economy at some point you have a big pit in the ground and a bunch of groundwater contamination um, you know, I came here from being down in New Mexico and Arizona where I was just working at the Navajo Reservation and, you know, we're looking at the choices between, you know, $2.8 billion worth of a coal plant, which is a clean coal plant, you know, if they want to call it clean coal, which is discussion now largely in the Bush administration in terms of climate change, 
you know, the idea of moving towards what they call clean coal technology and nuclear power, uh, both of which heavily impact indigenous communities. Because um, we have about two thirds of the uranium, uh, U.S. uranium supply on a worldwide scale, about 70% of the world's uranium supplies are in indigenous territories, good chunk of them over in Australia, northern Canada, our territories here in Namibia and southwest Africa. And so, you know, in the face of climate change and the issues that, you know, your university is dealing with in terms of climate change, the Bush administration and the main approach is to kind of stick with the, stick with the program. And so we're seeing the rise of nuclear power plant proposals again. You know, Florida Power and Light certainly has plenty of nuclear power plants. You know, looking at, uh, you know, more nuclear and uh, more mining in our communities and, and then this clean coal. And, you know, and I'm looking at this clean coal project and I'm thinking $2.8 billion. Uh, not, you know, let alone the mining impacts of that and, you know, how much wind could you put up for that, you know? They're getting 1,500 megawatts out of that, they could easily produce 2,000 megawatts out of that and they wouldn't have a big hole in the ground. I mean, that's the difference in a paradigm. Um, one which, you know, is centri creates centralized profits for a share, you know, stockholders and Blackstone Energy or S Sith Global Partners and, you know, one that creates local wealth and a local economy. and and a renewable energy economy, you know, even here, I, I don't mean to lecture you about, well, since I, you know, <laughs> since I am lecturing down here, but, you know, our land was not looking too sustainable. Not looking like that there was a lot of long-term planning, you know, from what I can see in the, you know, it looks like Fargo, North Dakota, which has, you know, I heard it had, uh, I, I mean, Fargo, North Dakota, I, I heard this figure that there's like a hundred strip malls. I don't know how many you have, but probably something like, like that. Haven't counted, but yeah. that, that could be you know, more, range. Definitely more malls than schools. You know, I mean, we passed that about 20 years ago. And so, you know, that's what we do is we shop and we, and we create this economy which is based on a set of practices which are, which are not sustainable. They're based on consuming goods which can't, you know, which create garbage. Um, we're good at that. But, uh, you know, the you, things you, I'm looking at are how you create something that's vital. When you talk about global climate change, there are so many different interpretations. What does it mean to you? Well, I call it global climate destabilization. Okay. You know, that is to say that I'm not really sure what's going to happen. You know, we pretty much have no idea. That's where I am, too. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about, you know, four degree temperature change in our area. You know, so what are the consequences of that? Well, I had a wind blow off a good portion of my rice crop this year. You know, and I'm waiting and, you know, and the rice was green in some portions of the lake and then the rice got blown off in some other portions and I, you know, was fortunate in that some other reservations still had plenty of rice. And so I was able to get enough rice to, for, you know, we have a rural econ you know, economy that's based on marketing our rice crop, and I had to go buy rice elsewhere. And that was an unusual weather event. It was an unusual set of weather events. We had hail. You know, I mean, you know, the same thing. I mean, you guys certainly have had your shared hurricanes, you know, and, the, and then, you know, the, and wind. You know, ours is largely based on wind, torrential storms, and hail. You know, uh, we've had, you know, tor more tornadoes that have touched down up there in our area. And then, you know, like, I think it's an eight-year drought in the Great Plains. Um, you know, Lake Superior is down 17 inches. Uh, they could not harvest wild rice on one of those reservations up there, and that, and that temperature change in Lake Superior is going to have some very dramatic impacts, you know, if that, if that continues. And so, um, you know, our thinking, you know, my thinking as a rural development economist, but also just as a human, is we got, you know, basically, you know, three choices. We could kind of stick our heads in the sand and hope someone takes care of it, you know, or I don't know if it's three choices, we, could min we need to mitigate. That's choice one, which is to recognize that it's happening and to figure out what we're going to start doing to conserve and what we're going to start doing in terms of our energy consumption, you know, which is the lion's share, is in our fossil fuels, and, and the reduction and the move towards a renewable energy economy. And then uh, we're going to uh, plan our resilience strategy. I mean, which is, you know, and that's what I'm going to lecture on largely today, is the question of where your food's going to come from, where your energy's going to come from, where you're, you know, how you're going to figure your economy for some resilience, for some tenacity, um, you know, based on the assumption that that's what we're going to need over the next 50 years and based on the assumption that, you know, I realize those guys in Washington aren't going to be in in 50 years, but, you know, my family's still going to be up in northern Minnesota, you know, and so I'd like to have a little plan on what that's going to look like. And, and the more we do at the front end in terms of mitigation, um, the, the better off we're going to be at the back end you know, in terms of the impact, because the reality is, is that, you know, as you know, and, you know, it's an exponential, you know, amount of change that we're looking at. And, the, and right now is the time to, uh, you know, to look at making those changes, whether it's towards renewable energy or towards cutting back our, our consumption. Um, and the more we do now, uh, the less baking we're going to do about 25 years from now.
Uh, you've written a lot about how we can learn from indigenous cultures in terms of dealing with energy issues and, and the environment. Could you explain that a little bit for the benefit of our audience? You know, essentially, and, and this doesn't just have to do with native people here. I mean, you know, to just give you a little bit of a construct, there's about 550 federally recognized tribes in the United States, about 700 indigenous communities in North America, a lot of diversity. I'm a big proponent of cultural diversity is very important, as is biodiversity. You know, monocrops are dangerous. Political monocrops are tr tremendously dangerous, which is, I think, what we are evolving to, unfortunately, in the United States. I, th I mean, I'm a big proponent of a, a multicultural democracy and a multi-party democracy, because uh, I think that vital societies um, are based on that, as are vital uh, bio you know, biocultures. So having said that, there's, you know, within the, the uh, wide variety of indigenous communities, and including on a worldwide scale, you know, 5,000 indigenous communities, and you know, basically everybody at some point was indigenous to some place. There's a sense of how you adapt your economy to the land itself, not how you adapt the land to your economy. You know, and that's a really fine balance of a set of relations. You know, and I don't think anybody in Orlando is gonna make the argument that, they're, that we're adapting our economy to the land. You know, in Orlando, we're adapting everything. We're you know basically collateralizing the land in a place like Orlando and turning it into a you know into a set of suburbs and into a set of strip malls. You know, not to be too disparaging, but you know it's you know it's a little perception one could get. You know, um, you know in comparison to figuring out how to do agricultural systems that are based on the contours of the land. I mean, two weeks ago or a week and a half ago, I was in Italy, and um, you know in this small community near um, near. Uh, it was called Trieste is where I was. And you know, I was looking at these Roman ruins and I was looking at these farms and these gardens. And you know, arguably those gardens have been there for a thousand years. You know, so I, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to say that people learn to live in an ecosystem. You know, and um, you know, the Romans obviously you know, had some illusions of empire which you know, had some significant implications and also on some level weren't sustainable. But those farmers still had a way to survive. You know, and that's the same thing with a lot of indigenous communities here. You know, a set of, of uh, philosophical or spiritual teachings about the human responsibility to the natural world, um, that you know, we are not, you know, that our, we have the privilege and we have the responsibility. I mean, because in America we like to talk about our rights, but we don't like to talk about our responsibilities. And you know, that is the other half of uh, rights is, is responsibilities. And, and so when we talk about private property, you know, and our right to do whatever we want to because we bought it, you know, well, what's our responsibility, you know, to the greater in terms of, of that? And, and those are the teachings that come from indigenous communities of, of uh, you know, you're going to be here, you know, in my community, I'm looking out at people, I'm dancing in our, in our, in our ceremonies, and I'm dancing, I'm looking across the, the, at someone that my great, 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 great danced with their ancestors. So, you know, what you're going to figure out is, like, you probably don't want to burn too many bridges. <laughs> you probably want to figure out how to, how to create a way of life that, because you're not planning on moving. And, um, you know, the transience of America, based on, you know, the idea of empire and the West as a state of mind, and we can always move someplace else where the pastures are greener, creates a false set of illusions that you can always find someplace else that's going to be better and that someone's going to take care of your garbage. You know, and it turns out that, you know, when they say throw it away, uh, there's, you know, where is a way? You know, uh, where is a way? It's down the road or it's on a barge trying to get dumped in a third world country or, you know, into some other community. Well, how do you break down responsibility? It sounds like you're saying that responsibility falls to all of us. It's not just yeah. governments, it's not just businesses, it's not just individuals, but everyone. And so often it's difficult at the individual level to understand what we might do. Where, where, do, where, where do we start? I think we're sedated. Okay, well maybe we're sedated, but, but yeah, how do I mean, we, how do we break that, out that of that? Look at your choices and you know, look at becoming conscious. I mean, conscious. We live in the most privileged country in the world. We're the richest damn country in the world. We have no absence of resources to do the right thing. We have no absence of wealth and no absence of technology. What we have is an absence of a will to do anything. You know, we're so self-absorbed. I mean, I, I just raised five teenagers, so I'm aware of where self-absorbed goes to and, and how we're taught to be self-absorbed. It's all about me, you know. And so, first of all, I mean, you know, so if you want to live in, in your own isolationist world, you know, go ahead, but it's not actually going to pan out too well. 
you know, over the long term. You're going to be on your, uh, your uh, what do you call it, your antidepressants in about 20 years. You know, <laughs> the rest of them. So go ahead, you know, be sedated. But if you want to be vital, you know, I mean, what I find is, is that, you know, the reality is, is that this is what's going on in the world. And we could pretend by watching Fox News and CNN that all that goes on in the world is individual crimes of people getting kidnapped. That's not the world. You know, the world is, is quite a bit more complex and a good portion of it we have our hand in. You know, whether it's worldwide politics or, you know, U.S. environmental politics or, you know, U.S. your Florida election politics, you know, for that. So how do you engage and become a responsible citizen? You know, you want the privileges of living here? You know, well, it turns out democracy is not a spectator sport and voting isn't enough. You know, it requires this constructive engagement of, of you know, you got, what, 48,000 students here. Smart, you know, got the privileges of going to school, have the privileges of thinking, you know, have the privileges of living in a petroleum era where you can, you know, think about all kinds of things. So what are you going to do with it? You know, so start with that, your own individual responsibility. And, and I don't tell people how to do it. You could say, you know, I could say, well, you know, I don't know how your farm to food program, farm to school program is here, but it looks like you outsourced your food program to a bunch of corporations downstairs from what I can see. You know, hmm, you know, 200 colleges around the country are running local food programs. You know, that would be one thing. You could, uh, I don't know how your energy systems are, but a number of colleges are looking at getting renewable energy programs in there and running buses, you know, I mean, you know, the chances of getting a parking space in some of these college campuses is probably about as good as your chance of seeing Elvis, you know? So might as well get some better bus systems, you know, in here and, and make it so that it's, you know, more accessible. Um, you know, run those things off of biodiesel and, and um, you know, I have, I have two cars. I have, I have a big SUV. I have a really big SUV. I actually happen to live in a place where you could use a big SUV. I mean, I don't mean to dis, dis some SUVs I saw today, but, you know, I, I live up in a, you know, dirt road on an Indian reservation in northern Minnesota. But my SUV runs on ethanol. You know, is that the best thing? No, but I'm not paying Exxon. Right. You know, it's a couple of steps above that. And then my other car is a 1983 Mercedes, which runs on biodiesel and grease. It actually runs directly on grease. I pick up grease from the uh, elders' lunch program, which horrifies me, the idea of how much grease the elders eat. And at Powell stands and rodeos, you know. And I clean it up and I run it in my Mercedes. You know, not to say, but, uh, you know, you could have a lot of grease-powered vehicles out here if you really want to. I'm sure there's plenty of grease in Florida, you know. I mean, I'm saying those are choices on how we, on how we do it. And, and bottled water, I'm a, I, I really detest bottled water. I think water's a human right, and you shouldn't have to pay for it, and shouldn't have it owned by Pepsi and Coke and Nestle. You know, it takes more energy to put the water in the bottle, half of it's junk anyway. And by the time you're done sucking it down, you got enough, you know, carcinogens in your body to set you up for a lifetime of misery. So, you know, ban bottled water, get some good water, you know, systems in here. And, um, you know, that's my advice, which they were going to invite me back now that I told you <laughs> what I think you should do. But, you know, oh, those are the kind of choices. And then come up with a plan. You know, I live next to F Fargo, North Dakota. is about 90 miles away from me. Right? And this is a city without a plan. And I'm moving over there, and we're pretty sustainable over on our reservation. And what's their plan? You know, they don't have any water in North Dakota, and they have strip malls just like this. So their plan is basically... Uh, to get water from the Indians to the west of them from some dam projects that are running at about 40% capacity because of climate change. Oh, so that'd be plan one that's not going to pan out. Or plan two is to get the water from Minnesota. I'm like, actually, why don't you guys figure out your consumption? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I think it's a fair question to ask a city like Orlando, what's your plan? You know, what's your green plan? Demand it, you know? I'd like to know my kids could drink the water t 20 years from now. You know, the city of uh, Lubbock, Texas, $100 million is what they're projecting to spend on water, you know, to import it because their aquifers run dry and their wells are running dry. $100 million bucks. Incredible. Now, you've traveled a lot around the United States and recently overseas and probably any number of times in the past. Where have you found communities that are more receptive to this way of thinking, where they actually are doing Anybody some of America. the right things? Anybody but America? <laughs> I mean, and, and, it, but I, you know, I mean, I have a lot of privilege, and I've been a lot of places, and, you know, Americans have this perception, you know, which is probably one of our political problems in the world, this perception that we're entitled to consume a third of the world's resources, and people should fork them over. You know, and so we're entitled to structurally adjust people's economies in third world countries so that they can produce products that arrive at our table at a cheap labor, you know, with a bunch of chemicals on them. We feel entitled to other people's oil, 
you know, because we have a bunch of, you know, vehicles that run inefficiently and, you know, we feel, in, in, so I was uh, last year in my world privileged travels, I was in, um, I was in uh, Kyrgyzstan and in Tajikistan, right? I was in Tajikistan, I took my 16 year old son with me and we're, we're on this river that, that we're looking at Tajikistan and the other side is Afghanistan, which I've spent a lot of my taxpayer dollars in, right? You know, I'm looking over this, and, and, and Tajikistan is this former Soviet crumbling infrastructure. But those guys have a road, they have clinics, <laughs> and they have some gardens. You know what I'm saying? They have kind of a plan and orchards. And I'm looking over there on the other side, and they don't have anything. And I'm thinking, wow, my tax dollars would probably be spent better building clinics and roads and some simple irrigation systems than sending any more weapons to Afghanistan. You know, I'd probably make a lot more friends like that, you know, but on this side, these guys, nobody has a lawn, mm -hmm. they have a garden, you know, and one of my personal, you know, things I'm looking at right now is I think that we should look at the value of lawns. I'm not really sure there is any, unless you think you're, you know, English and have a large, you know, English garden, um, you know, which I'm not thinking most of us are. I think you know? you're right. <laughs> so what are the examples of places that are doing a great job? Could you point out a few? And I'd also like you to comment on some of the countries that have really accelerated their development in the last decade or two, such as China and India. What does that mean long term for I think the, it for means the global a big headache. You know, I think it's a big headache. And I think that, you know, I mean, I think that there's two things is that I think that the reality is that on one hand, um, we say, well, we're screwed, excuse me, but, you know, because they're going to come in uh, China and, you know, this is going to make a mess, you know. But we don't want to deal with our own consumption, you know, because we just want to say we're just about to get slammed. You know, we did a really good job, you know, um, you know, I don't want to say, you know, encouraging people to absorb a paradigm that was not sustainable, but we could just say that. You know, the perception that, you know, you can go anywhere and watch American TV and you think you're living in the suburbs. You know, you aren't living in the suburbs. You know, I was over in China a few years ago, two decades ago or so. And, um, you know, they, they're not, it's not here, you know. So I think we've got some immense challenges. What I'm praying is that, you know, some of the best renewable energy technology is coming out of India. So smart people in that, in that country. I mean, that has, like, got some intellectual capital that is, like, shameful in comparison. I mean, you know, I am so astounded by the intellectual capital that comes out of India in comparison to the, the, the uh, application of the intellectual capital that comes out of the United States. Ours is so corporatized. You know, and theirs is arguably corporatized, but you know, we got a big wind turbine company coming into, coming into Minnesota, and it's uh, Suzlon, and it's from India. Mm. And, and the irony was, is a couple of weeks ago, I'm driving across northern Minnesota on these remote roads, and five lanes are, well, it wasn't, there's, only, there's only two lanes, actually, I should get real. There's two lanes and, and wide, wide uh, shoulders. They're blocked off on this road, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking, and it's a wind turbine coming in, it's going from Duluth to North Dakota. And I, I stop, and so me, I'm like so excited because I'm a big proponent of wind, and I'm like looking at the side of it, it says Tatanka, which is a Lakota word, which means buffalo. So I'm like, okay, it's going to the Dakotas. It's a Spanish wind turbine company, and it's going into North Dakota. And they're, they, they had to ship the darn thing from Spain across the ocean through the Great Lakes and then drive it to North Dakota, where North Dakota, like, has a wind turbine manufacturer and has wind, you know, has the whole capacity to do that, but they refuse to do it because they still want to burn coal over in North Dakota. They have the greatest wind capacity of any state in the country, and they, they still want to hang out with and burn dirt. So, you know, what I'm seeing is this changing world economy, which, you know, we are at the back end of, you know, richest and largest energy economy in the world, and we're importing turbines from Spain, and Span Spanish companies are owning the wind over in North Dakota. I just think it's an insane thing, you know. So people are thinking in a visionary way in Denmark and Spain and India, you know, and those are not like really radical, scary countries, you know. We're not talking like the evil axis here, you know. But, uh, you know, my own community is doing some innovative work. I'll talk about that in my lecture on uh, renewable energy, and I was just at this uh, big tribal renewable energy conference listening to arguably some of the smartest uh, Native American people in the country. I had a big headache by the time I got out of there listening. 
I'm talking about their kilowatts and megawatts and. Well, what in your opinion is the most promising of the renewable energy sources? It's very site specific. You know, I'm looking over here, you guys got some solar potential. You know, I'd say, um, you know, I've been looking at solar more than wind. You know, and, I, and I'm also, I'm, I'm a big co conservationist. You know, reduce your consumption, get efficient. There's no use putting on something if your windows are open or your, you know what I'm saying? Come up with a little better plan on that. Um, you know, and create a local solar economy. That's what I would be looking at. You know, it's a lot cheaper. It's going to employ a lot more people than trying to figure out how to sell more chips over at Disney World, you know, over the long term. And um, then, um, you know, in some places, but wind is big. You know, so we're looking at a lot of that. And, uh, um, you know, there's going to be some other, you know, there's different technologies that are out there. There's a lot of tidal power, you know, but my, the two biggest ones are going to be wind and solar. And uh, I'm going to stick with them and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to weigh in on them. You know, for us, we got some solar, and I'm in northern Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I'm putting up solar panels because I got a lot of sun even in the winter, but I'm this darn cold. <laughs> Good. Well, on that note, I guess we'll wrap up then. Winona LaDuke, thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate your time. And thank you for joining us for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Mercia. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.